stuff and welcome to Booktopia. Thanks for having me. Set the scene for us. Where does bad behaviour take place? So uh, bad behaviour uh, takes place in Silver Creek. Uh, the, the name of um, uh, the boarding school I went to as a 14 year old, which is up in uh, the remote uh, hinterlands, I suppose, of, um, of Victoria, about three hours drive from Melbourne. Um, and I attended the school, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I, like I said, I was 14 and uh, I arrived to a very Spartan unit uh, where I was to be living <laughs> with uh, 15 other girls. Um, but there I found myself, uh, there was no uh, heating or cooling, um, we had to heat our own boiler for hot water. Um, so, you know, a very kind of rigorous um, mm -hmm. program, um, as well as the everyday school life that we So it's to... kind of like school plus outward bound? Um, essentially, yeah. So we had the full school program, mm. which, you know, is, is busy and, and intensive. And then every afternoon, uh, or most afternoons, we went cross-country running for, you know, five to ten kilometres. That was compulsory. Um, and then on the weekends, we went um, on hikes and other outdoor pursuits. Um, and in the winter terms, that became skiing and community activities. So it was non-stop. Um, and you, you had asked to go there. You really wanted to do this. So you must have been up for all that kind of athletic sort of challenge as well as the normal program at school. I was, you know, pretty, pretty sporty as a teenager. I, I enjoyed, you know, the outdoors and, and that kind of physical activity. So, yeah, I was really excited. I really wanted to go. Um, I was, I'd, I'd come to the school on a scholarship a few years beforehand. But this year away, which was, you know, quite, quite well known within the school and, and you know, the outer world, I, I was, it was this real, sort of um, pinnacle, I suppose, of the experience that I was really excited about. But whose idea, Rebecca, was it? What sane educational body would leave adolescents of that age alone and unsupervised at night? Because that's when the real mischief starts. How on earth could anybody have thought that that was a smart idea? Look, that's a good question. Um, so the setup in the units was that we had no staff living within this, this it was the size of a house essentially. Um, we had a big dorm, we had a study, a kitchen, bathrooms, etc. But in the evenings, like you say, our head of, our head of unit, head of house, uh, lived you know, down the road, out of sight, uh, out of earshot. Um, and uh, after lights out, um, no one came and supervised, of course. There were people sort of patrolling for maybe half an hour to make sure we you know, weren't screaming and carrying on. But yeah, we were really isolated. Um, so I think, I think the ethos and the philosophy um, you know, behind the school when it was initially established on the campus in the 50s was, was really well intentioned. Um, originally it was a boys' school set up to foster a sense of resilience and self-confidence in its you know, boys' students. Um, these students were probably going to come on and, you know, go on and to become leaders in our community. So there's a real sense of, you know, um, building, building this sense of um, identity and confidence for, for life when school was over. Yeah. And then girls uh, attended the school from, from about the mid-70s onwards. Still a very masculine program, I think. Mm. And like you say, the issue of unsupervised girls in the evening every night, <laughs> night after night, from my, from, from my perspective and my experience, did become a problem mm. because there was a great deal of bullying that took place in the unit. Well, we'll come to the bullying in a moment because absolutely that's at the core of the book and you write about that so honestly and, and so brilliantly because you're write, writing about it from two sides, mm -hmm. as a bully and as a victim of bullying. Mm -hmm. But I want to know why you think female friendship is so complicated. <laughs> you know, in a way, we've got a kind of very romantic idea that girls together have these wonderful, intense friendships. But in fact, when you look at popular culture... It's full of films about girls being ghastly to each mm. other. And now we have the term frenemies. So we all know about the kind of mild version. You've got the ramped up version here. But why is female friendship so complicated? It's a, that's, you know, it's a really big question. And I don't think there's a single answer. Um, I mean, yes, we do now have these popular terms, frenemy. And, and I mean, of course... Not every friendship ends up in bullying or aggression, but I think I think to talk openly about you know girl and this is girls bullying particularly. I think we need to talk about aggression um, because I think it is you know a natural part of female friendship and development. Because so often, and this was certainly the case for me at Silver Creek, is the friend becomes the bully. I think 
boys tend to bully or pick on um, you know their peers or acquaintances not necessarily their closest friends but the aggression for girls tends to be in my belief and my experiences um, sort of born within the actual friendship group because bound in bound up in that aggression is love and intimacy and great passion which of course you know is a kind of hotbed of, of mm. feeling and emotion <laughs> which you know like a relationship itself can sour um, and for me at Silver Creek, I mean, you know, this, this environment was so unique, you know, it was really sort of, everything was intensified and magnified. Um, but I do think that, that, you know, girls love um, their friends very, very dearly, you know, these formative ages, but within that tends to be an aggression because, you know, the greatest pain you can cause your friend is to say, I'm not going to be friends with you anymore. And from that, we see, you know, whole, a whole range of, of tension. But also tied up with what you're saying there about aggression, I'm thinking about the fact that there is a power structure there and that that power structure is constantly testing itself, reasserting itself. So there are challenges that someone like Portia, mm -hmm. who's the kind of, you know, I want to say alpha male, well, she's the kind of head bully, <laughs> yeah. the charismatic girl that you want to be yeah. friends with. Um, so she sets tests and challenges mm. and of course mm. you rise to them. Absolutely. I mean I went to Silver Creek um, as, a, as a good girl, if you, mm. if you know, <laughs> to use that, you know, to use that term. Um, but also I was desperate to fit into this environment. I'd, I'd never been to boarding school before. Many of the girls were familiar with that environment and familiar with the power dynamics. I think they, they knew how to navigate this, this kind of life, you know, more easily, um, more seamlessly. So, yeah, I was really drawn to her. She was, like you say, she was powerful, charismatic, and she offered a kind of um, a safety but also... I felt powerful through association mm -hmm. with her and that was a very, you know, attractive, intoxicating, you know, uh, allure. Um, but of course, you know, the, the nature of that friendship, I think, was always going to sour. So after a period of time, um, you know, I found myself falling out of favour within, within that particular clique and, and I found myself on the outside, which was very painful mm -hmm. um, and also subject to various forms of bullying myself. So... Um, you know, I, I could see these patterns of my behaviour as a teenager. It's easier to look back on them now, but at the same time I felt quite helpless to, to do anything mm -hmm. about it because that, that pull, that want of, of belonging and friendship, you know, kind of uh, just came out on top. Well, one of the most poignant things about the book is um, the way you feel about your mother mm -hmm. in the book. Um, and I wonder whether you can tell us a little bit about that strand of the story because there's obviously a huge kind of emotional mm. depth of feeling there. Yeah. Um, you wanted things from her that she couldn't give you then. She didn't come to the school when you wanted her to. She didn't reply to letters for weeks on end. And this had a long-term mm. impact on your life as an adult. Yeah, I mean, in the, the, the book is set up in... in you know, two strands, that the predominant strand is me as a 14 year old and then I return to the school in, in the present, which is a few years ago, um, to re-examine this experience and to look at how it's affected me as an adult. And I mean, yes, you're right, my, my relationship with, with my mum in the book, you know, um, as a teenager sort of changes, I'm, I'm aware of the distance, I, there's a lot of longing for her, there's a lot of, a, of I guess there's a sense of the break in the communication between us. You know, we are we are hundreds of kilometres apart. We can only communicate via letters. When I arrived at the school, for some reason, there was a, there was a long time before my parents wrote to me. You know, I never really found out why that was. I think they just thought that I'd kind of get, you know, I was getting on with it, and 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 they didn't want to interrupt, you know, everything that was going on. So I don't think there were, you know, any any kind of bad intentions there. But for me, you know, I was horribly homesick. Um, and then throughout the year, you know, various things sort of happen, which, which sort of that, that distance between us grows. And of course, when I'm an adult and I return to the school, a lot of things have changed. You know, I've, uh, I've come to the realisation that I'm gay. That has not been an easy process for me and also for my mum, um, the, the challenges for her in, in accepting uh, my sexuality. Um, so that's really explored in, in those sort of latter um, parts of the, of the book. Um, that's very brave. And I gather that your mother still has not read the book, is that right? No, I don't believe that she has read Do the book. Do you want her to read the book? I would like her to read the book. 
Um, I think it would be painful for her mm. to read the book. It would. Um, but, you know, in a way, those sections of the book are, are, are almost like a, a love letter to her because there is that sense of longing, you know. Um, I, I hope that there will be a time in the future when, when we can, you know, come back together mm. and, and, and re-begin our, or restart our relationship. Um, but Do you, now that you've been through the experience that you've been through at Silver Creek... Could you imagine sending your daughter to a school like that? No, I don't think so. I don't think I would ever be able to afford to... Uh... <laughs> no, but I'm assuming she'd win a scholarship no, like you. Oh, yes, of course. Um, look, I, you don't want to say never say never, say never but I, th- I think, you know, the kind of program, you know, that, that Silver Creek runs... I just I just think that it takes a particular kind of student to, to come out of that, you know, really, um, I don't know, uh, unharmed in any mm. in any way. And mm. I, I I don't mean harmed, but I mean the development that you that sort of happens to you during the course of that year. I mean, fourteen is such an age where so many things are going so on. So vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Um, I'm sure that. Silver Creek has changed since I've been there. You know, I hope so. <laughs> well, it's been you know seventeen years or so since I was a student there. Um, so I know that there have been changes to, to the way that they run their program and everything like that. But um, I can't really ever imagine sending my children away unless there was no other choice. Um, but I mean, a lot of a lot of you know there are a lot of contributing factors to why they you know why parents send mm, their children to boarding school. Um, what's your advice to people who are watching this interview who are being bullied as they watch? What what do you think victims should do? Look. It's it's that's a really hard question. I think uh, communication is really important. Um, you know, you're not you're not alone. So tell someone. Tell someone. Have someone to talk to about it, whether that's you know a sibling or a parent or a teacher at the school, um, or another friend if there are other people within your friendship group that you can trust and can confide in. Um, if that's not an option. Um, I suggest starting a diary. Um, that's what I did. I certainly drew on the diary, um, you know, in order uh, to, to write this mm-hmm. book. Um, but I think for me, you know, the experience at Silver Creek taught me a lot about resilience and I only, I only came to that realisation at the end of the year and also at the end of writing the book itself. And so, you know, things will get better through your school life if you, if you are a victim of bullying. It's not going to happen forever and you will become a stronger person um, at the end of it if, if you can just kind of continue through it. And also trust in yourself and in the sense of who you are. And what about, um, do bullies, when they're bullying, do they know that they're being bullies or do they think there's something else going on? So if you met someone now and you knew that they'd been identified in a class as a bully, what would you say to them? <laughs> um... Well, I'd, I'd, I'd want to talk to them about, you know, these kind of behaviours, you know, what's, what's kind of compelling them Do bullies feel in... shame privately, do you think, for what they're doing? I mean, Portia... I think so, to an extent, but uh, I, I, I can't answer, you know, for everyone in that sense. Um, you know, it's, it, is a, it is a question of power. I mean, I think the, the bullying that took place in Silver Creek, in, in Red House... Um, came from a place of unhappiness mm. and loneliness. I mean, I think the girls who were acting out in this way were very unhappy. Yeah, and I think I that's really sad. I found that very sad, yeah. actually. I felt that the atmosphere in your house was one of sadness. Yeah. It was sad and lonely. Mm. And also, you know, when you're 14, you're not necessarily equipped, you know, with the language to kind of articulate how it is you're feeling. I'm feeling sad. I miss my parents, you know. I, I feel alone right now. Instead... Everything becomes, you know, mixed up and confusing. Um, and unfortunately, you know, people lashed out in that way and there was no one there to kind of regulate that, that behaviour. What do you think is the worst form of bullying that you've experienced? Was it something physical or something mental? Oh, definitely, definitely mental. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of, of actual physical aggression. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, that happens with girls as well, but it does tend to be psychological and emotional. Um, but I think, you know, the, the the worst kind of aggression I've experienced happened later when I was an adult because what I found through the course of the book that the, di- the dynamics of these friendships that I'd formed, you know, at an early age, um, were kind of repeating themselves. So they make a sort of template. That's what I found. Yeah. Um, 
And only through recognising that repetition was I able to sort of say, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm not so happy with, with the way this is playing out. And of course it became complicated when, you know, I realised that I was gay and I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to have relationships, I wanted to have a partner. Um, but then I found myself, you know, in one particular relationship that, that wasn't very healthy for, the, for those reasons. And I, I, I felt quite disempowered and, you know, that was as much my responsibility as anything else. So it was only through looking back at the past did I understand, you know, how this had, how this had happened and how I'd come to this, to this point. Thank you very much for telling us your story today, Rebecca. Thank you.